Welcome to lecture two in the course about hybrid electric powertrains, where we treat modeling, control, and optimization for these systems. And we are performing this under the umbrella of the Swedish Electromobility Center. This lecture will go into analysis of energy need and hybrid electric vehicle component models. And this lecture will be the cornerstone for hand in assignment number one. First, I start with a short repetition about the energy demand from driving missions and repeat a little bit about the forward inverse quasi-static models and then I will also repeat some basic physics that will be needed when we start to write down the equations for the vehicle motion. We looked at different energy paths and we mentioned that when we have specified the driving mission we have a minimum energy requirement that is propagating up and when we have a certain vehicle we get a vehicle demand and to get that we do the cut at the wheel and then we look into the vehicle and we have powertrain conversion that is taking the energy that we have stored on board and trying to use that as efficiently as possible to fulfill our driving mission. We will look at how this can be fulfilled so we look at the cycle is what is given and then we're trying to follow the cycle with the vehicle and in testing of vehicles we have a driver that controls the vehicle and then we're running the vehicle on a test setup on a dynamometer. We can also do the same evaluation in simulation where we have simulation models of the complete system. We talked about that this path is forward so we look at the driver's input. We give that to the engine, to the transmission, to the wheel and then to the vehicle. And the Vehicle speed is then fed back to the driver, so we, the driver is a feedback controller. This is standard simulation and most available tools can do this kind of simulation. So we are more or less able to treat arbitrary complex powertrains with this type of simulation. The quasi-static approach is developed towards giving efficient cycle following and efficient cycle evaluations for the component where we are focusing on the cycle as input and we ask the question if the cycle demands this what would be the requirement from the wheel force and the wheel force will give a requirement on the wheel torque and through the transmission we will get the requirement on the engine torque and the engine will output its need for fuel and if we replace the engine with an electric machine it will output its need for electric power that can be taken from a battery or maybe a fuel cell. This type of simulation has the benefit that it follows the cycle exactly as long as the components are able to fulfill the requested torques and requested forces that are needed. And it gives very efficient simulation because we don't have to tune the driver and there will be no errors in the cycle following. And there are tools that can help us make these simulations. So this is the QSS toolbox, which is a standard toolbox under MATLAB that you can run and test the driving cycles. The basic equations that we have, so this is a repetition of high school physics and the things that you have encountered in the mechanics course or physics course at universities too. You know that the mechanical work is the same thing as the integral over the force over distance. So we're getting how much work we have produced. Then the power is the same thing as the time derivative of the work production. And if we look at it from a vehicle perspective, the power that is required from the vehicle is the force times its velocity. The work and power relation is that we can integrate the power over time to get the work. So these are the same and this is also power that we integrate over time. And we see here that we have this natural variable, the natural change of variable here with V dt which is the same thing as dx. This formulation is something that we will return to because this one will be used since the driving cycles are most often specified in time and velocity. So what we need now are models that can describe the force requests that we have. Then we have everything to describe the work that a certain driving cycle needs. That means the energy that the driving cycle needs. The first one was for translational systems 
where we have force, work and power. And we also go to the rotating system that we have inside the vehicle where the electric machines, the gearboxes, the engines are rotating. And there we have the work, which is the torque integrated over angle. So we see here the angle gets the equivalent description as the distance and torque is the equivalent description of force. And for the power, the definition is the same. And when we evaluate it, we see that we have power is the same thing as torque times angular velocity. And the work here in the integral part, we see we can do the same thing here to get an integral over time, or we can work with an integral over angle. The driving cycles are usually specified in time, so they are most easily evaluated there. In other applications, when we travel a road and we have the road distance given, then this formulation might be more convenient. So the formulation you are turning to depends on what type of problem you have. We have Newton's second law for translational systems. There is the force imbalance that gives rise to an acceleration or deceleration. And in a rotational system, a torque imbalance gives rise to an angular acceleration or deceleration. And we have the mass here and we have the inertia of the rotational system there. This is the physical foundation for the models that gives us mathematics that we can work with when we do the analysis later. We will now look at the vehicle motion equation and start looking at the cycle energy demand. We will return to the vehicle motion equation and use it quite often in the course. The vehicle motion equation is Newton's second law for a vehicle where we're looking at the acceleration of the vehicle that is the result of the force imbalance, where we have attractive force that is aimed at pushing the vehicle forward. And then we have the losses that come from the aerodynamic losses. We come from the rolling resistance losses and it comes from the gravitational and then for completeness, also a disturbance force is injected. This disturbance force could be wind forces. Uh, the gravitational force is an instantaneous force depending on the road slope, but it's not a loss because we are storing potential energy while we're driving uphill, and we're getting that potential energy back while we're driving downhill. In the hand assignments, we will not work so much with these parts here. This one is more introduced to be able to make robustness studies or make uh, sensitivity studies to disturbances. So the most important ones will be these three here, but we'll cover also the gravitational because it's easy to describe with an equation. So I will walk through these now, starting with aerodynamic drag, then rolling resistance, and then the gravitational part. The first one was aerodynamic drag force, which is a loss. and as an engineer, if I wake you up in the middle of the night, you should be able to recite this equation to me that you have one half over the density of air times the cross section of the body times a drag coefficient of the bodies, which depends on the shape of the body times V squared. So this is like kinetic energy. If you look at it, it's V squared and then we have essentially mass that we're moving here. So that's the mnemonic I'm using. If you remember the kinetic energy, it's half mv squared when you look at uh, bodies. And this could be seen as we are moving air out of the way of the vehicle. So that's how I am remembering this equation. For example, when we have higher density of the air, then we have more air to move. So that's natural that we have the density here. And if it, the vehicle is bigger, it's natural that we have it here. And if we have done a good job and brought CD down, then it's also natural that we have it here. And that proximate contributions to the air drag is about 65% is from the car body, about 20% is from the wheel housings and 10% are from exterior mirrors and eave gutters and window housing and antennas etc that uh, stretch out of the body and about 5% is engine ventilation. Sometimes I have like this wheel housing. This is a low hanging fruit for trucks where you can save quite a lot in fuel economy by shielding the underside or the sides of the truck with its trailer. And also if you look at some concept vehicles, you can see that they are 
covering the wheels to save a little bit more fuel. Next component was rolling resistance and the rolling resistance depends on tire pressure, on the velocity and on the road surface. And we will look at how this dependence looks and then we have the normal force. So the normal force of the road contact is mg times cosinus alpha. This cos alpha is usually dropped because alpha is usually small. So cos alpha is very close to one, but it should be there for completeness. The rolling resistance looks like this as function of vehicle velocity. And we have the rolling resistance behavior as function of velocity. And we see that it increases with the speed and then it starts to accelerate here. And this is related to the stability of the tire and the maximum speed that the tire can tolerate. It breaks because the losses go up and the tire heats up and you can destroy the tire if you operate it for too long time up in this corner. Just to make you remember this edge up here and that you need to be a bit careful, I use the example of the Bugatti Veyron advertisement. It says that the Bugatti Veyron it can only run at top speed for 15 minutes, then the tires will break. But that's okay because the fuel tank only lasts 12 minutes when you run at top speed. So I hope you remember this that uh, the tire deformation goes up when the speed goes up and it can break your tires. Then we can increase the rolling resistance by deflating the pressure which is not good but we can decrease the rolling resistance by increasing the inflation pressure and this is a part for echo driving and that is make sure that your tires are inflated and uh, that they are kept inflated so that you're not going down and generating extra rolling resistance and also echo driving is that normally you shouldn't go up in excessive speed you should keep your speed range down here and not go up here because then you're starting to generate excessive losses the velocity has a small influence down here but increases sharply for high speed where the resonance phenomena start to occur that can destroy the tires in the book and also in this course here we will work with this assumption that the rolling resistance coefficient is independent of the velocity so we have just this description of the rolling resistance loss we could of course add a more refined component if we would like into the modeling by extending this constant with a function then we come to the gravitational load force which is not a loss since we're storing the potential energy and the basic equation for is it that we look at the gravitational force that is pulling it down and then we have the resultant force pulling the vehicle backwards in this uh, uphill slope. In most of the book and also in the exercises we are assuming that we're running on a flat road because most passenger cars are not so much influenced by the small road inclination. We see it's more when we come up to the 3, 5, 6, 10 percent slopes where we start to see influences on the dynamics. For just analyzing passenger cars and for analyzing them in standard driving cycles, flat roads are assumed. But if you want to really make a detailed evaluation, then you should also include the gravitational force, especially when you start to look at planning of vehicles and when you look at planning of heavy duty trucks. Uh, when they are traveling over the highway roads. So now we will put this together in the Newton's second law again and we will look at what happens in, during an acceleration if we have a stiff driveline so there are no flexibilities and the stiff driveline says that when the wheel rotates the engine will rotate proportionally as given by the gear ratio. So with this here we can now take the equations here from this and we take the equations here to put all of these things together and get a connection between them. So we see that these are connected together. So we say that the dry line is stiff then we have, and we have no losses in the gearbox. 
and the same thing goes here so we have this connection between the input and output angular velocities and input and output torques continuing we have the tractive force now that comes from the torque so the force at the wheel here will now depend on the torque of the engine minus the inertia losses because we're losing during an acceleration we're losing a little bit of the torque to rotate the engine and we're also losing a little bit to rotate the wheel so this is newton's second law where we are building up kinetic energy inside the rotational system at the same time as we're building up the acceleration of the vehicle so when we put everything together we get the following vehicle motion equation that we have the mass of the vehicle and that we're building up kinetic energy in, and we have the rotation of the engine and we have the rotation of the wheel that is also storing a little bit of the energy and when we come to qss we'll see how this comes in into the equation and why we have the lines in there now we have the torque from the engine that is translated through the gear ratio and from um, torque to a force so we have the force on the vehicle that gives us a driving force and then we have the losses here related to aerodynamic resistance rolling resistance gravitational and possibly a disturbance term so this is newton's second law that gives us the vehicle motion equation that includes the inertial forces the next thing we look at is vehicle operating modes we have the vehicle motion equation and depending on what requirement we have on the tractive force if the force is bigger than zero we have traction if it's less than zero we are doing braking and the special case when we have nothing so that like we're decoupling the engine then we're doing coasting and coasting is a special case where we require no force from the powertrain or from the driven wheel when we look at coasting we look at that f is zero here and we are seeing that the the deceleration of the vehicle is overcoming the losses that we have and this differential equation can be solved analytically so you see that this is a differential equation in v and in v squared here with a constant term and we can place it like this so we can bring it to the standard equation from calculus and that can be solved and when we solve it we get the following solution where the alpha is related to this constant here and that constant is alpha squared and beta is this constant here and since these constants are positive physical quantities we can take square roots of them and insert them as alpha and beta into this expression so provided that we're starting now at the given initial point so this is an initial value problem for a differential equation we know the initial velocity and then we would like to see how the velocity changes as the time increases from the initial point so this time zero can be changed to any arbitrary point in time and we can track it later so when we're looking at the cycles and we're looking at the demands we are looking at only the demand from the cycle we're only looking at what the cycle is demanding from us when we're doing decelerations in the cycle the cycle is delivering energy back to us but that is not the demand so when we do the analysis of how much the cycle demands we look at the need we have so we look at the points where we have attractive force so the attractive force is greater than or equal to zero that is when we will have the traction requirement so it's when the force is greater than zero when it's zero then it disappears here and so here we are integrating over the full distance but on the places when we have no demand for traction or when it's negative then if we identify these instances we say that we're integrating over only the time when we have traction so we get this ft times v so this is the power when we switch to t as the independent variable here we have used the distance as independent variable but here we're changing to t as independent variable to fit in to the mindset of using 
drive cycles that are specified as function of time. Now we only need to integrate over the time when we are in traction, and that was something that was highlighted in the cycle of previous lecture. And idling is not something that the cycle asks for, so it's not a demand from the cycle, but a vehicle might be designed to have idling also, and that you can investigate in the hand in assignment how much you can gain by including or not including the idling losses. In the handling assignment, you will solve this integral. And to solve this integral, you need to have a way of identifying when we are in traction and when we are not in traction. The switching is, of course, with the coasting. So the coasting gives the boundary for when we are in traction and when we are not in traction. And method one that can be used and that is proposed to use in the book. Then you start at a sample i and v. And you look at what is happening with the velocity when we go to the next time. And that can be delivered by the coasting solution. So we just insert the initial value here. And we insert the starting point here so that we have the time propagation in this component here. The method number two is the one that I am suggesting that you use in the Handen assignment. You take the vehicle motion equation where you have the acceleration, deceleration profile, and you have the aerodynamic roll drag, and you have the rolling resistance losses. By comparing these three terms to each other, we can determine whether or not Ft is positive or negative. And if it's positive, then we have traction condition, while if it's negative or zero, then we are in coasting or in braking. So then there is not a need for traction. To illustrate this, I will take the help of uh, my other tools and do some drawings. There is one thing that we will start with, and that is the mindset in this problem formulation that we have. And as some of you, like me, might come from the world of signal processing. When we work with signal processing, we look at signals. So we look at point values in the system. And when we work with the point values in the system, so when we're working with point values, we're working with the discrete points and we're interested in the values of these points. But as you remember from the problem that we're searching for, we are searching for the integral. That means that we are looking for the areas that we have under the curve. So we're interested in the areas under the curve that occurs between two samples. So that's the mindset that I would like you to be aware of and work with in this hand in assignment. So remembering that, it, that we're working with integrals and not point values, that's an important uh, point for the mindset of solving the problems. Then when we come to checking the tracking condition, it's obvious that we need to have traction when we go up here and when we go up here. But when we're coming to the deceleration part, then we might be able to get away with not needing to take an attractive force from the powertrain. So there we need to check whether we're in traction or whether we're not in traction. One way to do this is, so we set up the solution for the coasting profile. And if the coasting profile, we start in this point and we see where do we end up. And in this case, the coasting solution says that if we release the engine, we will roll faster than the trajectory is doing. So there we need to break. And if we would hit it exactly, so if we would go exactly through the point here, then we would be in coasting between these two points. Uh, and 
if we have more deceleration than the cycle prescribes, then we are not in coasting. Then it is a sign that we need to propel the vehicle to get to the next point. So this is how the coasting solution can be used to evaluate whether or not we are in the need of traction or don't have any need for traction. The other way of going about it is to analyze time steps and calculate the tractive force that you get according to the equation that you had on previous slides. You just evaluate how the profile changes and what the aerodynamic drag is and what the rolling resistance is, whether or not we are able to do coasting. And depending on when we have evaluated this over the time step, if the force required over the time step is bigger than zero, then we have a need for traction. But if the force is less than or equal to zero, then there is no need for traction. So this shows how the procedure can be used to estimate whether or not we are in traction and how the cycle will impact the torque request. So continuing to evaluate the integral since we're implementing the things in a program, we go from continuous world to discrete time world. The cycle is also specified with a sampling profile. So the data is sampled and you work with that data to extract the accelerations, the decelerations, the velocities. So we will look at taking this integral and we are replacing it with sums. So we evaluate the components that we have here. We have the FT, which depends on the different components. So the velocity is like this, the acceleration is like this and we insert these components in the traction condition computations and we use the velocities to look at the average velocity over a step and the acceleration over a step and then we use these to get to the losses so we we'll calculate a model that has the the average tractive force over each time step and the average velocity over that time step and then the dt here becomes the same as the time step length that we have in the cycle. Just a short word of warning, make sure that in most of the cycles the time step is 1 but you should always check and make sure that the time step is 1 or just always use the correct delta t between each sample that you have in the data when you're analyzing so that you're not building your code entirely for the assumption that the sampling time will be one. So this is just the preparation for being able to generalize in the future. So when we populate this one to look at the aerodynamic drag and the rolling resistance, we see that the, F, the tractive force is described by this function here where we have the acceleration, so it's mass times acceleration. We have the gravitational part that's constant and then we have the v squared part here that comes from the aerodynamic drag. And if we put these different components into their own parts here, so we have a sum of three elements and each individual element looks like this, where with the first one is v3 which comes from that this is v squared and then the number three comes from this guy here that the um, summation needs to have. So it's the power force times velocity is what we're integrating over. So this one also has force times velocity, but these are independent of the velocity. So it also be only becomes this. And this is mass times acceleration times velocity. And these are dependent on the trajectory. So they so these need to be computed for each integration step. So you should think of this as the values that we have in average over each interval. So now we are approximating the integral. We're not working with just the point values, but these are approximations of 
the integral. So as you see, these parts here now seem to be independent of the vehicle design parameters, and that's the way it's described in the book. But this traction requirement is actually depending on the vehicle design parameters. So it is not clear that you really can make this decoupling. And that is one thing that we have tried to investigate and also hopefully make you interested in investigating in the hand in assignments. So there is an assignment that checks how big change is it in the traction condition and in these elements that we have here with different vehicle designs. So does the vehicle design influence the cycle parameters or is it totally independent of the vehicle design parameters? Because in the book it seems like they are independent of the design parameters. And then it's interesting to know if that's true there. I can say that there's a small influence, so it's not totally independent, but we want you to gain experience from making these kind of analysis and asking these kind of questions. So we'll focus on, on these three. You will do calculations of these three for the example vehicles in the hand in assignment. So we'll write a for loop that makes the summation of the values of the cycles for these. So that's the main essence of one part of hand in assignment number one. So it's once you have understood it, it's simple in principle just to make a for loop that calculates all these components and summarizes them for each individual cycle where you're checking whether or not your interaction during the intervals. So think about intervals, not at samples, and think of identifying the traction, whether an interval requires traction or not. And then if it requires traction, then you add up these elements. And if it doesn't require traction, then you don't need to add them up. When the vehicle is at standstill, then there is of course no need for tractive force. Now let's look at these for the European cycle and the elements that we have in the cycle. So now we have these values with um, normalized distance. So for the different cycles, the NVEG 95, the total cycle, the European test cycle, we have the European city cycle, we have the European highway cycle, the extra urban drive cycle. And the values for the sums here are these for the air drag component of the, first, of the total one and the uh, next one and the highway driving as the highest. And the thing that I want you to reflect about and look at is, can you recognize the things that you're seeing in the cycle in the numbers? For example, the city cycle has low velocities and low velocities means that we're not really exciting the aerodynamic drag. So the aerodynamic drag should be lowest for that one and it should be the highest for the highway driving where we have really high speeds, we're going up to 120 kilometers an hour there. So it's natural that this one is the biggest there. Then when we look at this guy here, this is actually the fraction of how much we are in traction. And when we're driving at highway speed, we are in traction the most because we have only non-traction here and non-traction here during these decelerations while the rest is in traction. While the city cycle, we have no traction here, no traction here, no traction here, no traction here for the normal case of normal vehicles. So it's natural that we see that the highway part has highest fraction in traction and the city cycle have least fraction in traction. And when we come to the accelerations, we see that the city cycle has most accelerations, decelerations, so we're losing the most here, while the highway part has most of it um, in constant velocity, and the mix then is somewhere in between. So these values for the total cycle should be somewhere in between these two 
for the other cycle. So with these numbers we can go for the full cycle and we can express the full cycle into this magic equation that you have seen uh, in the well to wheel analysis sketch. And this is just taking these values and then packaging them with the appropriate units so that at the end you get the energy per 100 kilometers. So you just do the scaling to look at how much is the total energy usage over the cycle divided by the distance and normalized with 100 kilometers. Then you get the energy consumption over 100 kilometers. And this is also a task in your hand and assignment to come down to this equation for yourself that you could use to analyze new systems. So here we're analyzing vehicles and cars, but you could use exactly the same thinking to analyze any other engineering system where you have some time history that you would like to analyze. Some approximate car data, an SUV, a big vehicle with big frontal area and rolling resistance and high weight and then a full size car, compact car, light weight car and you can see the average power requirement over the European cycle is like this and the maximum requirement that we need to have during the cycle to keep the cycle is this. So the QSS thinking here can help us to evaluate the power requirements of a system. And the pack car 2 that I advertised as the a small cigar-like vehicle in the first lecture that is sleek and that has the world record in terms of fuel consumption has extreme values in the cross-section areas, extreme values in the rolling resistance and the mass is also really small so it cannot be used to drive the cycle and it cannot fulfill the cycle so it's no use of comparing it here it's designed to drive 30 kilometers an hour in average. So it's slightly above and slightly below 30 kilometers an hour in its uh, driving. So it cannot go up to 120. Then we now have all the components that we needed to get down to the driving mission. And we have a tool to analyze the driving cycles and get the numbers up to the wheel here. And the numbers up to the wheel here can then also be used to calculate the theoretical limit on the fuel consumption or the theoretical limit on the battery need to be able to fulfill the cycle. So that's what we can use it for and then we can add the losses inside the vehicle and come to tank to miles efficiency. At this time you can take a short break and I will split this session into three videos so that you will have better resting points and it will not be so stressful to follow all the videos in one sweep. So I suggest you take a break, you stand up, you shake out your legs and you get ready for the next part.